Hey everyone, I'm Jason Park, a filmmaker with Hyper 2 Podcast, and today I have a special honor to talk to jo uh, Tom Jolliffe, writer, producer, actor, does everything, composer, I mean, he just does everything. What's going on, Tom? Uh, yeah, I'm good, Jason. How are you? Good, good. And you're in the UK, right? What part? Uh, I'm near, quite near Oxford, so if anyone's seen Saltburn, I'm quite near there, where they filmed a lot of that. Okay, okay. And what's the... Uh, before I get into your history, what's the film community like out there in Oxford? Uh, it's not too bad. I, th I think most people tend to gravitate towards London, really, in terms of like the film community over here. Okay. But they're they're not very far in distance wise anyway, so you can get from one to the other within an hour. Mm -hmm. um, well, we're quite small in the UK anyway, so you can get anywhere pretty pretty easily. So let me ask you this, man. Like, how did you, you know, you've written so many films and all that. Like, how did you get started? Like, what was the inspiration for you? It really just started being just a film fan, you know, just like around Blockbuster, looking at all the videos on the shelves. Um, and I just kind of thought to myself, I'd pick up a cover and I'd wonder what it would be like to have my name on one of them. Um, I started reviewing films, first of all. So sort of film criticism came first started really just like doing reviews on imdb mm -hmm. um, and that gradually turned into doing it a little bit more professionally i guess uh writing for a few websites uh then i kind of got the idea of well i need to put my money where my mouth is really and maybe i should start writing films myself uh -huh. yeah so <clears throat> it was that really um producing just came as a as a consequence of wanting to get things made because sometimes it can be frustrating as a as a screenwriter you can have your scripts there ready even when someone takes it off your hands and it just goes nowhere so that's really what started me in producing starting off with short films and that was kind of to get things made um but once i kind of got my first uh feature film script sold it kind of snowballed from there so what was that like D dive into getting that first thing sold because you have many indie filmmakers writers you know they haven't sold that script yet what yeah. was that like how did that feel what was the process that led up to that it was just a process that i've been doing it for quite a few years you know you just look online for adverts or certain film community websites you know looking for people that are looking for scripts um and yeah it's just a case of you know keep doing it almost until you're fed up with doing it um eventually i sort of got into contact with a few people they were quite interested in a script i'd done um were these they liked agents, what I'd were, were these agents producers who were these people uh, these were producers so okay. i was contacting basically the filmmakers direct um indie filmmakers specializing mostly in kind of horror sure and you'll find when you're starting out particularly in the uk in terms of like the indie film industry that most people are kind of doing horror at the moment or sci-fi stuff you can kind of do on a low budget um so yeah i got my first break it was kind of like i'd sent them the scripts they liked it we were discussing another idea and then they kind of said, well, do you think you could write a Vikings versus Scarecrow horror film? And I thought that sounds awful, but I kind of like that kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah, I thought um, that sounded like fun to write. So yeah, I said, yeah. And it just, it's just snowballed from there really. So like, how did that feel though? Like to get that, that first win, right? Because, as an indie filmmaker, as an actor, director, producer, you're always searching for that first win. So that win leads to the second win, third win. Like I almost contribute it or, or compare it to like a car. When the car starts running on E, you have to get a win to fill that gas tank back up. So how did that feel for you? Because you were, you were at it, you know, for a while before getting that first win. Yeah, I think it was great really. Um, it was just a weird feeling when you first see like, you're the first piece of artwork that I saw for one of my films. Um, and then I first saw um, a DVD copy. Mm -hmm. um, they even did, for some reason, they did a merchandising T-shirt, although I never got a T-shirt, unfortunately. Um, so that was quite strange, but it was weird because, you know, almost before the first one had come out, I'd already written two others. Mm. So it's 
and they they turn these things around quite quickly sometimes so i mean i've literally had films where they've asked me to write something and a week later they're shooting Mm. um so yeah it's almost like i couldn't quite process it I'm almost still catching up now because it's just been five years, like nonstop, pretty much. That, that's a blessing. That's that's the yeah. that's the gift or the curse that everyone one in this industry wants, right? Just nonstop work, 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 work. So, would you say that when you got your first win, having those two other scripts in your back pocket was a, a big contributing factor towards your success or towards the continuation of the success? uh yeah i think so i mean like the first script that i sent them just to sort of see what that i could write basically um it's almost like a calling card um i can't even remember what the the first script was that i sent them Mm -hmm. but we were then discussing like a a sci-fi kind of film that kind of that got put on the back burner a little bit and then i did a couple of others in the meantime including scarecrow's revenge then the original one that they asked me to do which was sort of sci-fi uh, I think it was called Cyber Bride. Um, that kind of got re, that, that kind of got resurrected basically because there was a Terminator film coming out at the time. Um, so yeah, sometimes these things kind of latch onto something that's coming out on the big screen. Mm. But I would say always having as a writer, don't put all your eggs in one basket. So don't rest on that that one script, even if you think it might be the next Godfather. I think. Um, it's a good idea to have a bit of a variation and maybe have three or four different things, uh, maybe a couple of different genres because, yeah, there's a lot of people doing horror at the moment on very low budget, sometimes sci-fi, sometimes action. So, yeah, just have a lot, um, have some other options in case someone says, well, we like that script, but have you got anything else? Mm. Do you? Would you say that those, I don't want to call them oddities, but like, the mech scarecrow alligator arm or alligator man like would you say that those titles tend to do well like there's like a a niche audience that loves those type of films they seem to be doing really well i mean it used to be first of all it was kind of like the sci-fi channel things there was something that you'd flick across on like the cable channels at the dead of night and then um uh later on thank you okay See you later. And um, sorry, cameo from my daughter as no usual. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just one of those things. Like it, it's evolved from being like a sci-fi channel kind of thing to DVD kind of blockbuster rental, and now it's like massive on Tubi that people will flick past the most ridiculous sounding title and watch it. So those are kind of evergreen in terms of um, that kind of niche. And at the moment, you know, the IP thing. So everyone's kind of trying to, you know, there's three Mickey Mouse films at the moment that have been made and you've got Winnie the Pooh and everything like that. So everyone's kind of jumping in on the IP thing. Can you can, so, you, can you dive into that? Because uh, I haven't done any research on that. But so so what is going on with the Mickey Mouse, Winnie the Pooh type thing? Is that just like open for the world to just like create whatever they want with those characters now? Yeah, so basically what it was, Winnie the Pooh came into the public domain couple of years ago and then obviously someone made winnie the pooh blood and honey um i was actually asked to write that originally but i had to turn it down interesting um and in doing so you know they ended up getting it ended up being a razzie award winner so i turned down a razzie award oh man you could have had another award you know (laughs) yeah i could have had another one yeah Um, so what so when it goes into public domain like does that mean like disney was like yeah we're just not gonna we're not gonna copyright it anymore like how does that work Yes, I mean, a lot of so people often associate a lot of these things with with Disney, Mm -hmm. but Disney basically what they did was take properties and buy the rights, or they they had stuff in public domain. So like Cinderella, Snow White, that's been they've been around for like hundreds of years. Those Mm -hmm. things, Uh, Winnie the Pooh, yeah, that came into public domain, and then as soon as it did, it basically means anyone can do. Um, a version of Winnie the Pooh. They can't, however, do a version that Disney did. So, because Disney have certain image rights that they own, even if it's associated with the same thing that's public domain elsewhere, you can't have Winnie the Pooh in the the iconic kind of red vest or 
you know the oh, red shell. I see. So you 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 if it goes into public domain, you can do an iteration of it. Yeah. So you can so, put it in a yellow jacket, essentially. Ex exactly. Yeah. So yeah, you'll notice that Winnie the Pooh, Poo, Blood and Honey one and two that all the characters bear no resemblance to the Disney. And again, anyone. So for example, Cinderella. There's been quite a few versions of that, including my own. Um, as long as you don't copy the image that Disney Disney puts out, because that's still under copyright, um, then you're fine. So essentially, it's just giving, you know, a built-in audience that knows the name. You're essentially using the name for your own benefit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So everyone's kind of because Winnie the Pooh was like. It went viral and it was a runaway success. Everyone's kind of jumping on it. Mm. Um, the filmmakers are kind of continuing that trend as well by doing, I think they've got Peter Pan, Bambi coming out. Because again, Bambi was based on an old story, not Disney weren't the first to do that. Sure. Um, so yeah, as long as they don't make it look like a cartoon deer, like in the original cartoon, then uh, they should be fine. Interesting. So you've written a few, is it, have you written one uh, screenplay or have you written a few screenplays with uh, characters for, that's gone into public domain? Um, I've written quite a few. So I've done, I did a film based on Jack and Jill, the nursery rhyme, mm -hmm. which was just like a straight up kind of horror. It was a sort of Hills have eyes set in the middle of England. Mm. Um, and then obviously more recently I've done Cinderella's Revenge. Okay. And and how yeah. how is it writing something that has so much history? It does it make it harder? Does it make it easier? Because you have a lot of data to pull from? Like what's your process when you're writing something that's that has a lot of history? It's kind of in some ways you almost have certain things mapped out for you. Mm -hmm. So certain key moments, like you know, Cinderella has to go to the ball. Um, she has to get kind of tormented by her stepsisters, things like that. So you've got those kind of elements already in place that you can kind of follow. And then it's just a case of, you know, what are you going to do that's different? Hmm. I think what a lot of people maybe don't realize is that the very, very original stories. I mean, there was a, so it's Charles Pernod did a, a French version of Cinderella way back, you know, five or 600 years ago, whenever it was. And then a little bit later, the Grimm brothers did a version as well, but they're quite dark. So although people associate Cinderella with Disney, there's quite a dark history to those kind of things. Sure. And again, you know, you know that's there's so many Disney um, properties that have been based off like the Grimm brothers and these Gothic stories. So we're almost taking it back to the original. To where, yeah. To the, to the original where it's, quite horrific so, so there's certain things that we lifted from the original story involving trying to fit uh one of the stepsisters trying to fit her foot in the glass slipper mm -hmm. so we're going right back to cut which are quite grisly so we're going quite we're going back to that um the other thing the, the other thing that we wanted to do was some of these kind of like ip adaptations that are being done low budget horrors people are taking them into really dark places didn't quite, you know, serious. Yeah. So we wanted to make it a little bit lighthearted as well, have a sort of blend of comedy as well. Sure. So, okay. So when you write, like, what's your, like, genre that you prefer? You've written so many different things now. What's the genre that, like, yeah, that kind of lights me up. That, that, my fire is sparking to write this. Yeah. It, it changes, to be honest. I mean, sometimes I really love writing horror. Um, sometimes I kind of get this this mood to write action. I mean, it's just like my movie watching taste. Sometimes I'll be quite happy to watch, you know, Mega Shark versus Giant Octopus or something like that. Yeah. Um, I just made that up, but there's bound to be a film with that title. Uh, I'm, I'm sure. You know, Sharknado. The they they have like I saw one recently where it was like. I don't know. It was like an alligator on a plane or something. I'm like, okay, yeah. there's just so much stuff going on. I think they've put just about everything on a plane now, haven't they? So, yeah, yeah, they have. And that's what makes me think, right? When you think of film, like everyone acts like everything has to be this perfect, super nuanced, super gritty um, film in order for it to be a masterpiece. But in reality, 
if your movie can bring joy, laughter, and emotion or evoke an emotion, then you've done your job as not only as a writer, but as a filmmaker, as a production house, like you've done your job. Everything doesn't have to look like mine hunters, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you know, there is always an audience there for pretty much everything. Um, so yeah, I mean, for, yeah, for me, it kind of changes with, with the seasons, what I kind of prefer to write. If I've written a load of sort of horror films or, I had one stage where I'd written about two or three disaster films in a row, and I just thought the next thing I write has to be anything but a disaster film. Um, Do you feel like if you write like write disaster, 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 that each film is almost the same as the last because there's only so yeah. much you can do with disasters? It is sometimes because also in those kind of things, the distributors have a a certain type of film that they want, so they want it to tick a you know certain boxes you're not give, kind of given that much license to be too creative outside of what they think audiences expect um so yeah i mean the last film i i worked on was as a producer uh, as well and that was that's sort of like an art house drama so i completely went the opposite direction really away from I still had a few sort of horror elements in it because I couldn't quite leave that behind. But what's the name of that film? Uh, we go again. Is that out now? Uh, no, that's in post at the moment. So we shot that a few months ago. Okay. Um, and I yeah I I wrote, produced, did all the casting, locations, and uh, what was that process like? It's it's. I think there'll be a lot of people that. In, within the indie horror world that kind of know this or within the, in the indie film world that you have to be quite good at multitasking and taking, you know, different jobs on. Sure. Um, as long as you've got some semblance of an idea of what you're doing and you can do it uh, at least to a, a reasonable level. Um, because, yeah, budgets are tight. This one I kind of funded myself. Mm. So I made a bit of a grave error. <laughs> yeah yeah that's not yeah that's the last thing you should all any producer worth his salt will always say as long as you don't spend your own money you're doing all right but, but what, so what what made you fund it yourself was it you know the lack of wanting to wait for someone yeah. to fund it but ba basically that i just felt it came about quite quickly i just had this idea a couple of people i know actresses um were just saying that they've got certain availability at certain time of the year i'd had a few ideas kind of bubbling away and a few ideas of a kind of thing that i wanted to do um and it's not something that's kind of being picked up at the moment in the uk in the industry mm -hmm. um so yeah the the only real way to do it was to do it quite low budget and then basically fund it myself mm -hmm. otherwise i could be applying to film funds and just waiting around for you know months and years to try and get it made i mean there's a film that i really one of my favorite films of recent years is a film called after sun which is this kind of quite gritty drama mm -hmm. um based partly on the filmmaker's life it's a really great film because it goes it does something quite unconventional not really sticking to conventional narrative mm -hmm. structure on it but it took seven years to get made. And uh, yeah, I didn't really want to go through that kind of process to how, wait seven years. How many shoot days did you uh, shoot this new project? Uh, it was in about a week. So yeah, we shot quite quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Seven days, six days. That's that's incredible. Uh, wait, I'm assuming 90 minutes, 100 minutes. Uh, yeah, about, I think we're in at about 80, 85 minutes. 85, then you had we wanted to, yeah, we wanted to keep it obviously feature length but also comfortably under 90 minutes so it doesn't overstay its welcome hopefully yeah i do think that like with newer films i think 80 minutes like it, a 75 80 minutes is almost ideal with the shortened attention span i almost feel like with most movies as they hover beyond that 80 minute what happens is you'll notice and you probably if you dig back into your hat as a, a film reviewer right back in the day that a, a scene will be elongated or it'll just be a lot longer than it needs to be 
to drive the yeah. story forward so they can meet that 90 minute benchmark or whatever that is compared to let's just cut all the fat we'll be at 80 minutes we cut out 10 15 minutes and now the story's it's moving yeah yeah definitely that's that was the thinking really i mean in mainstream at the moment i mean i, I was only just saying this to another filmmaker i know today that it becomes almost frustrating when you see a film that it's almost great but it kind of overstays its welcome um and there's been a couple of well quite a few recent films i tend to find as well if a director is quite established um and they've got a track record of you know big hits cult hits that they tend to indulge themselves a little bit they make their films longer <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah that's that's fascinating because um as I've gone through my journey as a filmmaker, I've actually made my films shorter. Um, like there's certain scenes where like people are talking like this communicate, this conversation we're having right now and you can make it really long, right? But then are, is the audience engaged in that conversation? Is this useful information that will be applied later on in the film? Because if it's not, then it's just fluff. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I think you learn that sometimes even like if from a writing perspective, if I go and look back through older scripts and there may be 95, 100, 110 pages, I'll, I'll look through and occasionally I'll see something, well, well, that scene is basically the same as scene five, so I can get rid of one of them. Um, you start learning to cut and be a bit more uh, ruthless, really, and efficient. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And especially if you're thinking about you self-funded, you shot a week, um... You have to be as efficient as possible. So if something doesn't feed the narrative of what you're trying to portray to the audience, especially when you're self-financing and everything's coming out of your pocket, it's like, yeah, we don't need that. <laughs> we can cut that scene out. <laughs> so let me ask you this. What did you guys shoot the, uh, your latest project on? What camera? Uh, uh, Canon C100. Oh, did you see the new Canon C80 that just came out or the Canon C400? Uh, not yet, but I, I'm, I leave that to my brother. So my brother shot it. So we make quite a good team because I do certain things. And in terms of like all the technical stuff, he does all that. So, but I think he did mention the C, C400. So it's in, in his, uh, it caught, in it's his, caught his eye. Yeah. Well, no, that's awesome that you have your brother. I know that when I shot my first three films, I had my brother and I taught him, you know, how to operate the camera, all that good stuff especially for when I'm in front of the camera. And uh, it, it was such a blessing that I just always have my brother there. Then my brother went to the army and I was like, ah, shit. Okay, now with, like, what do you do, right? Because as an indie guy, it's like, all right, listen, me and you, we can we can carry, wear all the hats. So that's awesome that you have your brother that you can turn to and be like, hey, bro, let's shoot this. And he's like, all right, let's go. <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely, yeah. But no, no, if, if, he, if you guys shot it on the C100, the new... Um, your brother might definitely want to look at the the C four hundred is really expensive, but the C eighty that's coming out has like the triple ISO sixteen stops it stops a dynamic range. Like it literally has everything that you would want. Six K full frame sensor um, from yeah. a I don't want to say one man band, but one man that wears many hats. Yeah, I mean they've always been um, a good sort of lower cost alternative to the the more fashionable cameras i think generally they seem to do quite well in low light as well i quite like the um uh how they pick up color as well mm -hmm. so yeah i mean there's so many kind of uh, options now available to to filmmakers that are I, I suppose reasonably affordable um so there's always those options to kind of go out there and if you have a certain idea that you want to do which can be achieved on a low budget, then you can kind of go and shoot. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where I tell people, I'm like, listen, any camera that you use today, whether it's a, a Lumix S52X, Blackmagic 6K, the Canon C100, it just doesn't matter. The quality is so good that the nuances between that $1,000, $1,500 camera and that $30,000 camera are so minimal that the story is what really matters and drives engagement and the audience. Because, I mean, if you think about it, we've all watched big Hollywood films with the most talented cast, the, the most beautiful camera, the best color graders and editors, the most amazing sound score, 
and it still flopped and people still did not gravitate towards it or enjoyed the story. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like these days, this the script and the story and everything seems almost like an afterthought to um, certainly distributors and big studios. It can be a little bit like, well, that's secondary to everything else where, you know, as long as we've got a film with, I don't know, Captain America or whatever, and um, then, you know, we'll get the audiences there and we just have to have the, the right amount of big spectacle and, you know, set pieces, you know, good CGI. It's, yeah, it can become a little bit frustrating and particularly kind of like on the low budget indie world, kind of micro budget horror films and things like that. Sometimes there's not enough, you know, attention paid to writing something fresh and interesting. Sure. Well, what's, what's, what's kind of, I don't want to say unfair, but I'm going to use the word unfair. So what's unfair in today's world, when you're coming from the perspective of an indie filmmaker, right? So let's say your latest project, we're going to, that's an indie, that's an indie film, right? Through and through. Um, that we're judged against these Hollywood films with a thousandth of the resources, time, and and any of that stuff. But our story, the way it looks and the way it sounds, the audience will automatically compare it to something that was made by Christopher Nolan. Yeah. Right? They it, don't... They, they don't give us, they don't give us like, oh yeah, it's indie. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm okay. I see what's going on. They don't do that with us. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's really difficult because you could have even like Disney and a lot of their stuff, they get absolutely hammered for the quality of their CGI at the moment. And they've spent, you know, a hundred million or 150 million on a movie or a TV show or whatever it is, and they're still getting hammered for something looking cheap. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the guy down there making a 50,000 pound sci-fi movie is, uh, you know, they've got no chance. Well, think you know, sometimes you can kind of, you can help yourself by doing certain films or genres that wouldn't be too reliant on uh, set pieces or CGI and things like that. Um, but it's difficult because distributors at the moment only want to pick up certain things. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're almost being funneled into doing these particular genre movies or being another one that's kind of trying to ride on the, the IP train. What, so what it's, see, it's difficult. What do you see distributors leaning towards right now? Like, like currently right now, what style of film are distributors like, yes, that will work overseas. That will work. Uh, it, like it works right now. What, what genre is that? I would say at the moment, horror is probably a good bet. What I'm seeing a lot is that the kind of Bruce Willis movie of the week that used to do really well two or three years ago, you know, and whether that's now Mel Gibson or Frank Grillo or whoever, who, whoever those kind of name-driven action films aren't doing quite so well now. So people are finding it more difficult to get the money to make them. Distributors are kind of paying less for it certain channels and um stepping away from that entirely now so a lot of studios that were looking at doing maybe two to five million budget films are going right back and doing kind of low six figure films for sort of a hundred thousand and things like that so they're moving from action with maybe one or two names that were famous you know 10 15 years ago to doing more concept driven horror stuff for lower budgets. Um, so yeah, horror, horror at the moment, anything that's got some pre existing, um, you know, IP or that would be recognizable. So if you do something based on Dracula or whoever it might be, or another Winnie the Pooh film or Cinderella or Snow White or whoever it is. Um, yeah. So that, that seems to be what's going at the moment. I do think the IP thing with the whole Winnie the Pooh thing and all that, that's coming, that's Winnie. probably toward the end of a cycle now. So it's, I don't think it's that evergreen um, compared to certain other things. Um, Would you say that like, cause I, I feel that when I think of the energy and I think of the landscape and I'm going to say Hollywood, as far as like 
United States filmmaking. I don't know what it's like overseas, but I feel like that there's a rise of indie film that's about to happen because the current landscape of making $100 million, $50 million films and not making that return on 90% of the films that are released, that they it's not maintainable, right? So there used to be hundreds of productions and going on all at the same time. Now there's like 30, right? So yeah. the, the, the shrinkage is so massive that those 30 have to be hits. And if they're not hits, then the next year around, those 30 will be 15, right? Because you can only continue to spend something that doesn't bring you a return for so long. So I think where the indie rise will happen, and if you think of like a Netflix, a Tubi, or any of these things, they were built on indie films before they got so big and they were like, ah, we don't need you anymore. But indie films typically, because we have to be so creative that you're gonna get the most original story from indie filmmakers because you're getting that story made from that mind of that person without someone else telling them, hey, we want you to do this or we want you to do that. Yeah, for definite. I mean, in, in recent sort of maybe the last 10 years or so, you've seen A24 films have kind of risen. Um, they've become really popular. It's almost like the, the young cinephile has kind of gone up towards A24 and latched onto it. Mm -hmm. Then you've got Neon as well. And they're making these kind of lower budget films. This is kind of like the high end of indie films, obviously. But, you know, they're making these films lower budget. They're picking up some interest, making a profit, and they can keep making them. And generally, they've got more, they've got more scope to do something a bit different or a bit interesting or subvert something. Um, what in, in the sort of really low budget horror indie world, what they've not really picked up on yet is making something a little bit different, you know, outside of the box um, to kind of do, a, I guess, like a lower level A24, if you like. Mm. So, yeah, trying to make something a bit interesting, quirky, different. Um, they're still kind of trying to work on this low budget kind of production line mentality that kind of mirrors the the big leagues. So, yeah, it's it's quite tough at the moment because obviously certain platforms are starting to make it more difficult and they're being more selective. Tubi at the moment seems like the last kind of place to go, the last golden egg for, you know, low-budget filmmakers that are working on, you know, less than a million budget. How long that lasts, I don't know, because at some point if the filmmakers are making too much money, um, that's when they, these, these companies start thinking, well, now we're going to start um, making it more difficult for them to make money. Uh, then we're going to be more selective. Tubi are also moving into doing their own things as well, um, which means they're buying less content. Um, so, yeah, the, there's never been wider options for filmmakers to get their things distributed. But it's really difficult at the moment in terms of you see production levels are right down. Uh, that's on all levels really. So even at my, my level where it should be relatively easy to for, put, to put together, you know, 50,000 or a hundred thousand and go off and shoot a film. It's really difficult at the moment to find investors, particularly in the UK. It's not as bad in the U S but it's still not nothing like it was pre COVID. So I hopefully, I have a thought on this. Do you think that that's going to change or you think it's going to get worse as time goes on? I think if it, if it changes, people have got to be more, more mindful of the, the quality of what they're putting out. Not just to, there's a bit of a, the problem is there's a content mentality at the moment that goes from top to right down to the bottom where it's Let's just get something out there. Yeah. We'll get something out there. You get a lot of low budget, um, indie distributors that just think, right, we'll put 30 films out a year. We'll make, if we make 10 successful, that's us sorted. The other ones doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the whole, the whole model of streaming has made it quite difficult in terms of revenues. Yeah, there's more options than ever to get your film distributed. But in terms of actually making money, it's really difficult because 
if a streamer pays you know fractions of a penny per stream amazon yeah <laughs> by, the time, <laughs> by the time everything filters down to the filmmaker you know they spend <clears throat> they spend massive amounts of time kind of in the red waiting for it everything to turn into the black so there's a, and be into overages yeah there's a few thoughts on that like so amazon used to pay really well and yeah. then now they pay like zero 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 one cents every hour watch or something crazy like that Tubi right now pays well but for like you said for how long does that last before they're like ah now we're moving into netflix territory so i have like two thoughts on it one thought is i believe films will become what theaters and plays are today it'd be like a like a novelty thing where it's like hey let's go watch this movie because the, the attention span on your cell phone or whatever new device comes out is only going to get worse they're only going to flood you with more right but on the other end when i really think about it and you think of okay when did things make the most money it was when everyone was watching tv right a show would be on tv or a movie would be on tv it'd get 10 million views they were paying buku bucks what i think is going to happen is the streaming platforms caused a, a riff everything was going streaming there were no commercials it's like okay what you made is what you made but if you notice with all these streaming platforms they're going back to cable tv they're all throwing their ads back on you know they're all having ad versions because they're seeing the success of tubi jump from 30 million viewers to 100 million viewers all ads Amazon Prime, you pay for it, ads. Um, Hulu, ads. Like Netflix, I'm sure they have an ad option or they're going to bring an ad option. So now- Yeah, they do, yeah. Yeah, so now essentially yeah. you're back to cable TV, but instead of you having a cable box, you just access that same information through the internet. So what will happen yeah. is, I don't know if it'll be negotiated, but at some point it's like, okay, well, there's 5 million viewers on this show or this movie when it released and you have all these ads, where's my share? Yeah. I mean, it, at some point it has to, it has to be figured by these people, these big studio executives that if the filmmakers aren't making money, they can't continue making films. So, you know, in, in the end, it is more beneficial to actually have some money that actually is trickling down because you've got to go through the distributor, maybe a sales agent, um, sometimes several distributors. You have to filter through maybe one or two sales agents before it gets to the filmmaker <clears throat> once they've cleared expenses and all that. So it's uh, it's really a, a difficult model at the moment because I had a film, Jack, Jack and Jill, which I mentioned earlier, that must have had about over 10 million combined views. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if that's 20, 25 years ago, you know, 10, 15 million people watching your film, then I'm in a mansion somewhere living it up. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, these days, it this the streaming model doesn't mean anything really in terms of people making money because even distributors now are struggling to make money. I mean, people keep, you know, people moan a lot about rogue distributors kind of, fudging numbers and ripping people off but i mean even though they're starting to struggle now so yeah it's it's really tough well i have an interesting take on that right so you'll get a lot of uh indie filmmakers that are upset with their distributors but in reality it's like ma the majority of indie filmmakers you're not getting those views people who just aren't watching your project because you're responsible for the marketing so if you're not yeah. if you're not putting a lot of money into that marketing and you don't have a crazy marketing plan, a lot of people aren't watching it anyways. So the distributor's like, well, you haven't made anything. There's nothing here. And unless you know you cap that marketing budget in the contract and you say, hey, instead of you're able to spend whatever you want, you're able to spend five thousand dollars in marketing. So whenever that that breakdown comes, it can't go beyond five. It's just I think we put so much into our films that we we think that they're better than they are right like yeah. you can't help it like i know nowadays i rarely watch a film twice now i'll go back and watch a film from like i just watched um uh jack reacher with tom cruise from like 2010 like i'll go back and watch an older film again but it's been like 10 15 years since i've seen it whereas you know you guys are working in post-production on your latest film you've seen it a hundred times you were there when you shot it you're like okay yeah. like i am tired of this film 
but when when the premiere happens when you do the theater you're gonna watch it again and again and, and and somehow be engaged in it because you made it whereas if i just watched jurassic park yesterday i'm not gonna go watch jurassic park today because it's no longer engaging to me the way it was yesterday yeah definitely i mean a lot of you know modern indie filmmakers don't really understand that you have to put a lot into marketing yourself and it is it's really difficult i mean even if you know even if the contract with a distributor might say that they can spend up to five grand or whatever on a on uh, marketing that can end up meaning very little because mm-hmm. um, you know you can do you can do paid ads you can do this that and the other and those still get no traction um so you know you're you need a, you need a little bit of marketing but you also need a bit of luck to get you know picked up by the algorithm you need to get a certain amount of word of mouth or a lot of luck man mace yeah you well, do need a whole lot of love, yeah. That that and that's why I try to like I think about it. So like I have a film, I've cut it up in like two different things. Originally it was four amigos, then I cut it up as Furious Fast Atlanta to try to bite off the Fast and the Furious name. Then I cut it to Fast Atlanta. Combined it has like a million views, right? Uh, yeah. but what people don't realize is if you're fully monetized, and I'm just using the YouTube model, and you're fully monetized and you get a million views, you're gonna get anywhere from fifteen hundred bucks to three grand, right? Depending on how many times they watched it. It just depends. The views don't matter as much as the watch through and how long they've watched the, the movie. So 1500 to let's just say a thousand to three grand, it can kind of range anywhere from there. So that means if your movie hits it out the park and gets 10 million views, you're making anywhere from 10 to 15 to 30 grand. Yeah. Where are the distributors? Where are these platforms? Where are they making this money? Uh, so you as the filmmaker, you're not making a killing. The, the Tubi might because they have 100,000 films and each film is making whatever. So now they're taking that large model and taking percentages from each film. Yeah, exactly. It's just it's a model that just does not work long term. Um, and again, we've kind of come to this. Everything kind of gets dictated a little bit by what happens at the top in the mainstream and everything kind of filters down. Yeah. Um, so when everything kind of ground to a halt with the strikes and everything that put a lot of other productions lower down affected them um <clears throat> covid as well didn't help in terms of making this a viable option for investors because it used to be that you know film could be quite a good investment um now if you're an, if you're an investor looking for certain things then you're looking elsewhere you're looking to sort of property things like that um and those kind of slightly ego driven, I don't know, like the Wall Street guys that might chuck a hundred grand into a film just for the sake of doing it to get their name on a poster, mm-hmm. they're they're a little bit more mythical now. So they're almost like fairy tales. They don't yeah. exist anymore. Uh, so you not really got that option so much. So it's it's really tough. This is kind of why a lot of studios and filmmakers are now working on lower and lower budgets, but there comes a point where you can't get any lower. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, you're right. It's to the point where it's like, Hey, we used to make this for 6 million. We need to make it for 600,000. So I don't know how you're going to do it, but go get it done. Yeah. So let me ask you this with your latest project. You know, you, 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 you've worked for a long time. You've written a lot of films. You've been in the industry. How are you going to go when this film is done? Are you going to self-distribute? Or are you going to go through a distributor? How are you going to make that work? I think what I'm going to do is I put it through some film festivals first and just see what the, the reaction, the pickup is like. I mean, that that can be a way to get some organic kind of marketing and get, pe- you know, get the film on people's radars. Um, so after that, I'll see how it goes. But, you know, I... I'd thought about perhaps Film Hub, but again, that from being like when it came out, being quite a rev- revolutionary thing that seemed to favor the filmmaker. Now they're kind of making it more difficult. Um, they have all the uh, the paid tiers now, right? Yeah, <laughs> and it's not like it's not like a like a hundred bucks. It's like a like a yearly thing, right? I I think so. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's just that thing again, where it gets to a point and then they start making it more difficult. 
So yeah, people are waiting slightly on a knife edge to see what TV do in the next, you know, 18 months or so. Yeah. You know, I, I used to have this thing where I was like, man, I would never put my films on YouTube or whatever, but I had this epiphany where I was like, man, I'm putting every film on YouTube. And the reason for that is because it's the largest video consumption platform on the planet. When people go to YouTube, they go to YouTube to watch, you know, content, movies, whatever. So when you compare the the Tubi's, the Netflix, the HBO's, everything to YouTube, it's not even close because everyone in the world uses YouTube. And you can see all of your metrics. You can see where they watched it from. You can just directly see everything. Now, you may not make as much as, let's say, a Tubi. You know, I don't know what the rate difference is. But to all the filmmakers, I'm like, man, if you get if you go Film Hub route um, compared to a distributor route, you go Film Hub and you get it on Amazon Prime, Tubi, may, you know, maybe the CW or Peacock or whatever the case may be. I'm like, put your film on YouTube too, so you can get that audience over there too. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't necessarily hurt the other. So I know a lot of my films get put on YouTube as well, simultaneously with everything else. Yeah. Or maybe even just for a short window, sometimes they'll do it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's it's one of those things that there's so many platforms now, it's difficult to know whether you put all your eggs in one or two baskets or whether you spread it all over the place. Um, but yeah, uh, I think it's, it's definitely a, a valid option though on YouTube, as long as you, maybe you've got a pre-existing following or you've got enough subscribers there already, it can really help kind of kick things off. So let me ask you this. If you, if you were writing your first project today, right? You have a writer that's listening. What advice with all your experience that you've gathered over the years, what advice would you give that person breaking into the industry or just writing their own film? I would say, you know, write the best thing you can have plenty of options as well. So, you know, try and have four or five really good scripts. There's always that chance that, you know, something slightly bigger budget, will come come of it and it will get picked up by a slightly bigger studio um yeah have all those options in places but i think also do it because you really want to do it and because you, you you enjoy it and you you love film and you love writing because i think if you expect to kind of get rich off it you might be in for a bit of a shock those days are over <laughs> <laughs> those days of making that one film is over yeah, I mean, I remember hearing stories about a guy that wrote a Steven Seagal film and he made like half a million. This was even like, obviously this is going in the straight to video era. So the guy who wrote Into the Sun, I think it was, used to be a cop and then was his bodyguard or something for a while. And uh, yeah, he sold a script for like mid six figures uh, for a film that cost sort of 15, 20 million dollars. 20 million dollars those days even those days are gone now so yeah it's quite difficult man that is awesome well so tell us where can people find you where can they watch your your movies lay it all out yeah so yeah most of my films are on amazon Tubi, all those channels um can best place to find me is on instagram so that was that's at jolliffe productions and how do you spell that uh, so yeah, J O double L I double F E. Jo okay, Jolly. Yeah, your last name. You're laughing. Jolly yeah. Productions. Okay, and that that's on Instagram. So one last question before I let you go. You know, you 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 have all these projects. You're in post production on your latest film. What do you have next? Like, what's in the pipeline next for you, or or what do you want to do next? Uh, so I'm still producing a couple more things. I've got. Uh, I've got a film in pre-production at the moment, a thriller. So this is another one that I'm I'm co-producing. Uh, that's going to shoot uh, a little bit end of this month and then next month as well. Um, I've got a few more scripts that are kind of waiting in the wings to go into production as well. Um, I'm just in the middle of working on a new sci-fi kind of film, sort of in the vein of The Iron Giant. Um, so yeah, there's lot, lots of things happening and then it will just be a case of seeing 
what's happening next year, whether I kind of pursue producing a bit more or kind of step back a bit and just work as a, as a commissioned writer. So you're just, you're just constant. You're just constantly doing stuff. Yeah, it is nonstop. I mean, I can see that it's a little bit quieter than it was, mm -hmm. but yeah, it just never stops. I think partly as well, because for example, if I'm just right as a, being as a paid writer, like I said before, that I've had a film where I've been asked to write it a week before it goes into production. Mm -hmm. So I write it a week later, I've handed it off and that's me done. But as a producer, you can be, you know, sort of working and beavering away on a film for three or four years. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Like, what was that, the, the migration from writer to producer? Like, how did you, how did you change lanes like that? I think part of it was wanting to do things a little bit more uh, that I wanted to do. Um, and also to have a bit more control over the the end product as well. Mm. So in terms of like, I've got a film called The Baby in the Basket, which I co-produced with a friend of mine. We'd worked together before um, on a film. And uh, yeah, so we put this one into like this gothic horror film that we really wanted to do. We both kind of like the same sort of film. So we were, we kind of conjured up this idea and I wrote the script and then we put it into production and then that will hopefully come out later this year, early next year. But, you know, that whole process started in 2022. It's going to be sort of just over two years, two and a half years when it finally comes out. And then you spend the next year or 18 months after that kind of, waiting and seeing how it does in terms of performance and constantly having to promote it. So yeah, it's a really long process, but you know, if you want to have more control over the quality of what you're putting out, then you have to produce, you have to be the producer as well. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Do you feel like your days of, of reviewing film films, do you feel like that's helped you with your current films? Like, you know, from a, from the critique point of view, because I'll say a lot of us as artists, we don't really critique our own stuff. Like we, it's, it's almost like they're held in a special box. Are you able to be like, okay, if I was me as a reviewer, how would I look at this project? Yeah, <laughs> I actually do rate my films on Letterboxd. So yeah. <laughs> do you do you give them all like a high scores, or do you like ah, this shit's a six? <laughs> um, no, I'm quite. I I tend to be quite honest. I mean, there's some. There's some films that I, I do like and some films that uh, there's points of frustration in certain films. Like there might be like one film I did called Sky Monster. Um, that was actually the one that I, I wrote in a week and they were filming. Yeah. Because they came to me a week before shooting and said, look, we've got a, a plane set has become available and we want to shoot a film. So it was kind of like, this is the idea we want. I wrote the script, delivered it. And then they shot it and everything like that. But it's got some of the worst continuity errors that I've ever seen in films. Yeah. In the final thing. And I'm just, you know. So, yeah, if you want to kind of be a bit more, if you want to have a bit more say on the quality, you do have to produce, I yeah. think. Yeah. I will say this. <laughs> I will say this. On my latest film that's now in post production, um, I have one glaring continuity issue. And it drives me fucking crazy to the point where I'm like, okay, we're going to go film this additional scene to break up, right? This, these two scenes to, to put it right in the middle. So the audience will forget. Like I'm, I'm literally yeah. adding a scene just be because what happens is <laughs> when you film, you know, scene 13 and then scene 47 and then scene 22 and then scene, like I have a system where I use colors for days. But because while I'm filming, I've changed things up so many times that this one thing, it goes from like, I shouldn't even be saying this because now people are going to know, but <laughs> you know, forget it. It goes from like the, the, the female character wearing a short sleeve shirt to a long sleeve shirt back to a short sleeve shirt, right? Now, yeah. mind you, there are three different scenes, but the way it is in the movie right now is they're back to back to back. So I was like, okay, the way that I alleviate that in the first scene, she's wearing a black short sleeve. The guy says, hey, I'll meet you at the restaurant in an hour. So 
if I then cut to the restaurant, her in a long sleeve, them being outside, you can get away with that. You can say, okay, that was on purpose. She put a shirt on, right? Yeah. But then now when they're back at the office and she has a short sleeve again, it's like, okay, I need to put a scene right in between that. So at least some time and things have happened before that next scene. So maybe the audience forgets it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's one of those things though, but I think you're, when you, especially if you made something yourself, you're just that little bit more uh, critical, I guess. And you kind of, you're looking out for it. But I think, you know, even like in the mass, the biggest budget films, mm -hmm. they have, errors like that all the time don't they yeah and they've got people they've paid like you know three or four people or to watch sometimes it. the whole department to watch it yeah yeah so well what, the, what got me they always slip past and that's the thing that kills me because i'm sitting here editing right i'm looking at it and what kills me is that in the script the way i had it it made sense right like these were different scenes but when i'm editing the entire movie and i'm and i'm thinking of like when i edit everything is a flow right it's kind of like how is it flowing in and out I'm like, okay, these fit here, but now I took scene 22 and scene 41 and I combined them, but these originally in the script were two different days. So that's what happened. Yeah. But yeah. hey, Tom, Jolly, it's been an absolute pleasure, man. Thank you so much. If there's one thing that you could leave the world with before we go, what would that be? Uh bit more money for the people who need it there you go bit more money for the rest of the world tom it's yeah. been an absolute pleasure i will talk to you later brother thank you so much